Welcome to the Propreneur Podcast, where we help practice owners become better entrepreneurs. I'm your host, Dino Watt. All right, everybody. I think we are now live. It takes a minute for it to refresh here on Facebook. Um, as soon as it pops up, I will be able to see all your questions and uh, how you're doing. Thank you, everybody, for being here again for another Facebook Live. I'm excited about what we get to talk about today with Dr. La. Let me bring out my... So I want to get it to where I can see all of your questions. So before we get onto questions and stuff like that, everybody, if you can, as you come on, make sure that you... All right, so let's make sure that you uh, put into the comments where you're calling in from, or where you're listening in from, what office you're calling in from. If you're from an ortho office, we'd love to get that to find out where you are so we can give you a shout out. And uh, if we have any questions, make sure you put those into the panel as well. Sorry, I'm just setting up my whole screen here. Wow, look at that. We got a ton of people and we got Nicole coming on. Nicole, she's always been a stalwart. She's coming to almost every single one of these Facebook lives here. Thank you, Nicole. Kristen, Ada, uh, Todd, Glenn, Amal, Sherry, Lori, Stefan, Renee. Make sure you put in there, uh, say hello, and tell us where you're calling in from or where you're where you're reaching in from. We got George, Denise. I love it. I love seeing all these people pop up. I really appreciate you all being here and supporting these. And of course, my goal is to give you guys as much value and great content as possible. And tonight is not going to be a disappointment, I promise you. I've known Scott for too long that I can, number one, jab him a little bit if I need to, make him laugh a little bit. Uh, I won't I, I won't get him on him about the, the mustache because it's totally Texas and it's awesome and it's rocking it. And I could never, ever, ever grow that, by the way. Uh, but uh, I also know that he is just a wealth of knowledge and I'm honored and I think we're all going to be privileged to have Scott here today. Before we get into all of that, I wanted to also remind you all to, if you're not signed up uh, through on uh, my email list, tomorrow we're making a huge announcement about our challenge. We're gonna do a challenge starting the 11th. We have all next week to enroll all of your friends and yourself uh, into our Selling Through the Screen uh, program that we're doing. Uh, Scott, we might even talk about this a little bit later on. It's obviously a lot of offices going virtual the difference between having someone live in person with you and selling to them through your with your TCs and then being through the screen and understanding the body language aspects, understanding how to connect with them through the screen. So we're gonna so we're gonna teach you all how to do that through our engine. We're gonna teach you how to prepare for that. So make sure you sign up. Wow, hey Eric, love it. Uh, Eric Wu's there, you know Eric. Uh, Eric said he loves the mustache. Uh, Mike and Pete and Melissa and Heather and Tim and Jody and Frank and Todd. Thank you all for being here. Remember, check in, say how you're doing, and uh, tell us where you're coming in from. Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Love it. Well, that's the announcements that I have there. Also, I do want to encourage you all to follow Smile Doctors Braces on Facebook as well, as you see on the ticker right here, to make sure you go there and follow them as well. Well, uh, Scott, how you doing? I'm doing awesome. Through yeah, this, through all this, yeah, through this, this new, new reality that we're living in. Yes. Well, well, it's for you. I'm sure it's not like you've left an office because you have pretty much an office in your house, like with all the people that are there. There are so many people in your office. It's like having a crew or a team there. <laughs> it is. It's a zoo. We call it more. It's it's almost like a zoo. Dina. Oh man, it's great. That's awesome. You have a amazing family there, and uh, they're in Texas. You're in your new office right there. Is that correct? That's right. This is it. Got my long horn representing. Yes. I saw it when it was studs. So that's awesome. I love it. It's beautiful. Well, tell us a little bit, Scott. I always love to talk about people's stories and how they got into what they do, because I think stories are what connects all of us together. So can you tell everybody your story of why you got into orthodontics and kind of the quick journey? And the reason why I had you, I want to have you on this live is because you built your practice right after the 2008 recession disaster, during the recession, I should say, after 2008 collapse, what a wealth of knowledge this is going to be. So tell us your quick story about why you got into orthodontics. For sure. Um, I, I always wanted to be, well, when I went to dental school, I wanted to be an oral surgeon, I thought. And then, and then once I got there, I, I realized the impact you could have on people and how much better a fit was orthodontics. And it was up to Don Winchus. He's a, he's a famous orthodontist. He and his twin brother, Dan, uh, really impacted me that, that, this, that ortho was the way to go. 
Um, I, I always wanted to do it. I, I tried to, to have the best grades that I could. I, didn't, I wasn't the sharpest uh, tool in the box. And so I had to work really hard. And um, anyway, ended up getting into ortho. And then, and then, like you said, when I was coming out, 2009, graduated, and then needed to, needed to find a place. My wife's requirement was somewhere warm. And so <laughs> initially we wanted to go back to Arizona, but that didn't, uh, didn't pan out the practice that we, that we wanted to go back into. It just, just timing wasn't good with the economy. And so we were looking for anything. And fortunately we found a practice in Killeen, Texas of all places. So just North of Austin and came here and, uh, it was all opportunity. Well, let me ask you, what was the environment and the, the kind of the energy around building a new practice, starting a new practice, buying into a new practice at that time? Because if we just had the crash in eight, I'm sure there weren't a lot of people going like, yes, you could do it. Good idea. Good, good idea. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I think in, in my class and in a lot of ortho classes at the time, people were really nervous. Uh, what were they going to do? I, in fact, I didn't have a job. Um, the one that I thought I had fell through and that was somewhere around April. I ended up graduating in August, but it wasn't, I didn't nail down my associateship until weeks before. And uh, even then it was a handshake deal. I wouldn't advise this with anybody, but it was a handshake deal and came out and, and worked for me. It ended up, the guy had a ton of integrity. So nice. he, uh, he sold to me 60 days later, just as he'd promised. Wow. And, and it was and just like that, um, he was done, didn't come back in the office, and I took over from there. So you uh, had a little bit of an advantage in the sense of you've been an entrepreneur for a while. Mm-hmm. Like, I know the backstory. I know that through college, like, you didn't come from a uh, privileged upbringing. You, you and Jessica created businesses throughout college. DJ, you're a DJ like I was. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, right. Like you, you had to think a little differently outside the box. How did that help you in building your practice? I think I, uh, I loved it because I didn't have the same mentality that a lot of, of typical orthodontists did. And, and it was, we just got to scrap, be a little bit different, figure out what it is that the, the consumer wants and, and give them that. And very much from a, I would say that in orthodontics, we're very paternalistic in Mm -hmm. how we deliver care. And we're very ego driven with our time that our time is the most important beyond, beyond the patient. It's really easy. I can't count how many times it's, it was easy to just say, uh, just have them come back in a week. We don't have time today, you know, and, and just, just stuff like that. We're really, we were the ones at fault mismanaging the time. It wasn't the patient. And yet we make them suffer, make them pay for that and come back later, miss work, miss, miss school, miss, and it costs them a lot more money for treatment um, just to, just to be away from work. So anyway, it, it was that kind of mentality of breaking rules, doing things that, that we could do, whether that was in marketing or, um, ways that we connected with patients, throwing dance parties, throwing, oh, I don't know, DJ lights on the ceiling and then turning all the lights off to celebrate a D-bond. Just, just stuff that, that many years ago was, was kind of frowned upon by the traditional orthodontist, but a lot of people took note and saw that it worked to connect with patients. Well, I was a witness of that. And this is some of the areas that I love that you said breaking some rules, because that's what I really want to kind of get into a bit with what's happening right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, right now, I think is an amazing opportunity to rewrite some of the rules that people supposed they had inside of their and inside the industry, right? I, one of the things that drove me when I would talk to people was the idea of this is the way it's always been done. Or this is the way the guy before me did it, so I'm just going to continue doing that, right? I got to witness some of those rule breakings, and I wrote about it in my book because back then, this was 2012 when I first came out and saw your office out there. Mm -hmm. That, like, isn't it crazy to think just eight years ago, um, Same Day Starts was a radical idea. Like, having somebody come in, and on the day they came in, gave them the opportunity to get braces on the day they came in that was one of those radical ideas out there so there's one and of course that's grown and now people are like well yeah same day starts of course you got to do same day starts right it's like everyone's doing it 
what else did you do that was radical? I know a few things I want to bring up, but I want to see what you bring up. No, no, no. I think like, actually, I remember with you, I'm going to turn the tables a little bit and talk about you. Okay. I remember at, and we should tell that story of how you got into ortho. I think that, I think it's, I yeah. think it's um, but um, I remember early on, you were speaking to a group of orthodontists and this is a very, this is a very famous group of orthodontists and I was in the audience and, and you were giving a lecture talking about how we need to empower our team. Mm-hmm. And, and you were saying, like, what are ways that, that doctors show that they have power? And one of the things you showed was that doctors have always worn a white lab coat, you know, traditionally. And that's a sign of authority, a sign of, you know, this is it. And, and they stand in front of their diplomas behind their back and all that stuff, right? And that was just kind yeah. of the positioning. And... Uh, and a lot of them, I think, in this group that resonated with, a lot did that following Caldini's, you know, advice of, of that. And anyway, they set their TC rooms up. But you said, why don't your teams wear white lab coats? And when you said that in, the, in that audience, you could have heard a pin drop because all of yep. a sudden they all got really scared that, that you, had, you had minimized their value. Mm. And, and I remember looking around like, that didn't go over, you know, with this group. <laughs> and, and, I, and my wife and I, we were sitting there high-fiving each other like, yeah, yeah, why? Why not? And I think too often one of the rules that we broke was that we made everyone else around us, including our team members, we wanted them as important or more important than the doctor in forming relationships with patients. Um, of course, the doctors are going to be the only ones who diagnose and treatment plan and do right. what they legally have to do. But there are no rules saying that you can't train your team to be able to look at an x-ray, look at a, look at a case, and understand it. Understand ortho, understand tooth mechanics, understand talking to a patient, educating them in order to help them feel comfortable, in order to help them you know, accept treatment. In order, in order for them just to have all confidence in the office versus in the ego of the doctor. Which was one of the things that I really connected with in your office was, and that's one of the reasons why I say that to doctors is, it's about transference of authority, right? We have been trained as, since we were babies, if you're wearing a white lab coat, you must be a doctor or have authority. Yes. And we've been trained that way. If you're wearing a military uniform, you must have some sort of discipline and you understand the authority. And so the idea being, let's transfer that, to, especially to your TCs, if they're not closing well, if they're not feeling like they're able to hold that authority with the patient because the patient wants to talk to the doctor, we'll just put a white lab coat on and psychologically their brain will go, oh, this person must have authority because, I mean, we do it with actors, right? Maybe, Yeah. Yeah. To this, to this day, you watch Grey's Anatomy and they're still wearing white lab coats, not because they're doctors, but because they want you to think that they want you to think that they are doctors. So in your office, the same thing would happen. Right. And I would see this. You said to me once, I'm creating mini orthodontists. Yes. Yeah. And that was brilliant because it, number one, showed me that your ego was out of it. But number two, it was that like I used to work for Disney. And at Disney, they were creating little mini Walt Disney's. Uh-huh. And the idea was that every cast member was to treat the guest as a as if they were Disney. And that's how you create culture so powerfully, right? Because you can grow as big as you want. Walt Disney's been dead for more than 50 years. And yet you go there and you feel like you were touched by Walt Disney in some way. That's right. In your office, you have a lot of uh, team members but whether I come in and I see Scott Law or not, mm-hmm. I feel like I'm connected to Scott Law or at least the culture of Scott Law because I've created, I'm being treated by a little mini Scott Law. That's right. A little mini orthodontist, yeah. Yeah, we call it a mini residency. Yes. That's, that's, what, we, that's what we run. And, and it's funny because people, orthodontists will come and visit and they'll, they'll want to see kind of the morning huddle and want to see what's going on. Well, actually... They don't think that they want to see the morning level. So that's another thing we broke. I mean, most of the time in, in ortho, I think most would say, yeah, you know, I show up five minutes after we start or whatever, Dr. Uh. Kyle Waltz is in. And then, but the team is supposed to be there. Excuse me, they call it the staff. The staff. Well, whatever. And then, um, you know, and they're supposed to get it together, figure it out. And then doctor shows up when doctor shows up. 
And we are ones where we will run a case, throw up a case from the day before, and then go through and pop quiz one of the, one of the clinicians and say, what do you see? And then they will go through literally diagnose and treatment plan that case. And then we take photos on every visit, every patient. Yep. And we're able just to see how it tracked, how did it work out, and then really, really confirm, and then we all learn. But why in the world, it never, it never made sense to me why an orthodontist wouldn't want every eye that looks on that case double checking for the, for the good of the patient. So, yep. that, so that that case turns out as awesome as it can. And can I tell a story? I want to tell a little story with. Yeah, with, sure. With members. So I remember this. So this happened. It was, it was Christmas Eve. Uh, actually, it was the 23rd of December. So we were working. And right before we get off and we we're going to take a few days break. And a patient walked in. It was at 4.55. We usually close around 5. And a patient came in and she had cochlear implants. Except the implants, um, the batteries had run out. It was the end of the day. And so her dad was, was signing, translating for her, and he said, all she wants for Christmas is braces. Well, of uh -huh. course, we were like, let's do this. So of course. Real, quick, real efficient. We have it all timed out, how quick we'll take x-rays, photos, and then get in the TC. So we get in there. I'm so excited because I'm like, I'm giddy. I'm going to give, you know, she's going to get, get braces today. Christmas miracle. Home. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's like, we're going to do this. And she had some overjet, but pretty class one on the, on the buckle segment. So pretty good. So, so I'm busy like explaining with my hands, the old hand trick, cause, cause we had to get into that. And, uh, just real fast said, we're going to fix you up. We're going to, we're going to really get nice wide buckle segments. These in the front are going to come here. She's asking questions like, are we going to have to drill the braces into her teeth? Cause she's ready to go through any amount of pain. Wow. So she was extremely motivated. So I was touched. I'm touched today by it. Right. So, so we go out. She, she gets them, we're heading out, and then one of, the, one of our team members signed. And she said, actually, in the, in the deaf culture, they don't clap. Instead, this is the clap. And yep. so, exactly. so, so we're all there. Normally, we celebrate when somebody comes around to get their braces on. The whole place goes oh, no way. And so we're waiting for her. She comes around the corner. We all, we, all, we all clap. And she starts bawling. We're all crying. We're like, yes, this is great. Throw her in the chair. And we have our assistants set the brackets on the teeth in, in the position where we have trained. And then doctor comes over for final positioning and doctor approves final positioning, moves what we need to, and then we cure. And so we get there and we're placing, the brackets are being placed. And then I hear from our, our clinical, clinical point, her name is Maria, Maria Bibian, she's a rock star. And she goes, hey, Dr. Law, um, I didn't know, can you come look at this baby tooth? And I went, and my mind's racing because I'm talking to dad and I go, baby tooth, I don't remember a baby tooth. And so I walked up and I realized I had, in, in my haste, I totally missed that there was a supernumerary lateral, an extra tooth on the front. That's why she had overjet, right? And so I went, whoo, I said, okay, well, you know what? We'll just have that tooth. We're, we're just going to have that one wiggled out down the road. And we'll, when we, I, I explained it to dad, did all that. And, uh, and then um, we, we made up for it, went perfect, talked to dad about the timing of all that stuff, and then um, did it. We bonded it up. And then I'm waiting around the corner after she left, we celebrated. Maria comes around the corner, and I, and I looked at her, and I gave her the biggest hug. Okay, and then, um, sorry, this is, this is it. I said, thank you so much for having my back because you could have easily thrown me under the bus or made me look like a fool or, or done anything there to say, to say, you know, hey, there's an extra tooth. It's not in the chain. Doctor, you didn't write it. All, all these things. And, um, and she, she looked at me and she said, you've had my back so many times, you know, and, and I think that's one of the things is that I never, ever, ever would have thrown anyone under the bus intentionally ever um, in front of a patient, never embarrass them. And, and in doing so, we create just a phenomenal team that's able to work together for, for, for one another and for, for the patient. So I know that was a longer story, but that's, that's the kind of that's culture. That's amazing.
that's kind of what it is. So it, it does. It sums up what you guys do there. I mean, uh, you could talk of that story. We could talk about, I mean, and I, look, I've been kind of on the periphery for the past eight years after coming to the office and working with you guys, but seeing things like Ruby's story, I tell Ruby's story all the time. I tell Ruby's story all the time because she's a rock star to me and that you guys supported her in, in what she wanted in life and her passion. And we talk about this and that's the creation of a team. And you mentioned a moment ago, like it's not a staff. I, I, I talk about it all the time. I use that analogy all the time. Staff is an infection nobody wants. You know, you create a team because you want to win the Super Bowl together. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, it's, it's so powerful and, and it's palpable. The reason why I chose to write about in the book, and actually, you know, you mentioned a moment ago, kind of my story of getting into orthodontics was primarily because of working with you and seeing what the opportunities were there of seeing like, man, I thought everybody got it the way that you got it. I was a little spoiled because I got to work with you first. Right. And then when I went out to their offices or I talked to other doctors, I'm like, why would you ever do business like this? Like, it doesn't make sense. You're about 10 years behind the curve. And I mentioned at the beginning, you having that entrepreneurial spirit and the entrepreneurial background. Uh, I was lucky enough to interview Cameron Harrell just a few weeks, about a week ago. And he talks about how entrepreneurs, you know, there's only about 3% of society that are true entrepreneurs can handle the ups and downs, the roller coaster rides, the creativity, all that stuff. And take that into the ortho world of how small there are true of entrepreneurs people buying businesses who maybe shouldn't buy a business until they know how to actually be an entrepreneur because you have to be, you're forced into being it. And so when I saw people who weren't that, you know, you came to me and said, okay, Dino, for what you do, there's a space here. There's a space. If you just go into that space, no one's doing what you're doing. No one's talking about what you're doing. And we're hearing a lot of the same messages over and over again that you could actually come in and dominate in this space. And I have taken that and ran with it, right? I've been like, cool. I get to use all my skills. That yeah. I know. And Including video. You were the first one, and, and we need to talk about that. I mean, you saved, saved my marriage. Via, <laughs> I don't know. Just, and, and that's how you and I got acquainted was yeah. with Jessica and I working together. That was very, very stressful. Yeah. And I had to change. And it, so much of my way of being needed to change. And sure. That, and that has been a major journey for the, that I've been on. And, and, and well, if, well if I can. The, the ability to sell, to do all that, that you're, you're the best I know. And so this opportunity, look at you seizing, seizing yet. Another oh. Opportunity. And, and I think that's what people should do is, is we have to take advantage of this time. Well, that's, I appreciate that because I really do think that one of the things coming out of this, you know, a lot of my uh, story, look, when this all came down and COVID happened the first week, you know, we all thought it was going to be, okay, we're going to have three weeks off, you know, or whatever, or a couple of weeks. And I immediately went in and I created a training around how to survive COVID, right? Thinking it was three weeks. Well, then when we quickly found out a week later, less than a week later, that it was going to be longer than that, I turned to Shannon and I said, I just want you to know, um, I'm about to stop payments for all of our clients. We're going to have zero income. Okay, that's the first thing that's going to happen. Second, I'm going to work harder than I've ever worked before because this is happening for us. This is happening for our business. I mean, I get a little emotional even thinking about it, of the idea of, I remember just feeling, you know, when you have those like kind of spiritual downloads yes. and you have those connections of like, this is the time. I went, if people will, will see what this is, that this is an opportunity for every one of my doctors, every person I could ever speak out to, to say, you can totally change your business the way you want right now. You can pivot. You can, all the policies and procedures that you didn't have time to do before, you now have time. Yeah. All of the opportunity that you wanted to seek, but you didn't, the books you wanted to read, the people you wanted to not work with anymore, the people you wanted to work with, this is the time. And so I took that to heart and I have been like nonstop because there's a part of me, and this is sounding like it's a more, this is a, this is a conversation with Scott and, I, Scott and I. You guys cannot listen to this part because this is Scott and I being buddies talking. It sounds so egotistical, but I truly, ha- there's a part of me that really believes this. I believe that everything stopped so people could pay attention to what I can do for them. Mm. Mm. I really do believe that. And I believe that if people will see that for themselves in their business, 
if they will raise their hand and say, this is an opportunity for us all to love more, to connect more, to serve more. I've done everything I've done for the past month and a half to serve. Mm -hmm. I've wanted this industry and other industries to see what's possible. And um, I, I know that you have that desire in what you do too. We've talked about this before. And sometimes even to the point that you don't even understand why you're doing it. That's right. I remember being in that seminar that you were giving that Ruby was talking and somebody asked, why do you, what do you guys do with lates and no shows? And Ruby was stumped. And she was like, I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. We don't have lates and no shows. And both of you tried to give a half hearted answer of like, I don't know. Why do we do this? Whatever. And I'm sitting in the back of the room going like, I know why you don't. Yeah. It's because you've created a culture that people don't want to be late to Disneyland. Yep. People want to be front in line. People want the fast pass. Why would they show up late? And you didn't even get that. And that's what I want people to get is there's opportunity there for you. There is. There is. So, so great. Okay. Enough about me. Let's talk about building a business. Cause now there's a lot of people, as you know, you, you've, you have doctors that you deal with every single day and there's the, some of them, the freak out of, uh Oh, how are we going to get people back? Uh, I mentioned on my Instagram story just yesterday that I had a doctor who was fully expecting a 25 to 50% downturn in new patients when we come back. Mm. And I said, why would you expect that? And he goes, well, that's what people are saying, the average. As a matter of fact, I won't name who it was, but there's a publication that just came out, I think it was the day before yesterday, where the title was The Average Practice Loss. Mm. Well, I don't want to deal with people who are average. And no. so I told to him and I said, you're not an average doctor. You weren't doing average before this ended. Why would you expect average now? And why would you even go back to your office and lead from a place of we're going to be average? Yep. You are not average. No. Central Texas orthodontics, not average. No. Smile doctors, not average. Correct. How do you lead people to come back to what's happening right now? What is your conversation? What has the conversation been like for you? So along those same lines of what you're saying, I think I was in another study group and I'm, I'm sharing some because because it was just so, so shocking to me to hear how, how people reacted. I remember one guy put up his goals for what he wanted to grow his practice that year. It was like 3%. And I went, Whoa. <laughs> why? It's why? Not a goal. Yeah. Why? I mean, that's inflation. Like, like, what are you doing? And whereas our goals were like 25 and, and we want, we want 30% growth. We, we want all of this. And that's, that's what our clip was. In fact, in fact, pre COVID, we were almost 25% growth as an organization across nearly 225 locations. Wow. So it's just, it's not, I don't know. I'm, I'm just not going to settle. And so coming out of this, I'm like a, we all are. I'm like a caged animal. I cannot wait for the green light for that gate to open so we can just run. And, and a lot of what we get to talk about um, in our group, it, it, there's strength in numbers. And that's, what's so cool is part of the culture that we had back when 10 years ago and the same today is to surround yourself with awesome people. Like, like if I had to be around that person who was satisfied with a 3% growth or, or that was their goal, I just, I just wouldn't hang out with that person. I, I, I don't, I don't want to be around that kind of small minded thinking. And yeah. so there's just such, there's such potential out there for us to grow in any number of ways, whether it's an orthodontic practice, whether it's who we are personally, who, how we want, our relationships, including our marriage to go like, what do we want and actively pursue that? And so that, that's, that's the mentality. And that's, that's kind of how we've always done it. It's like, let's push and push to see what we can do and watch it bless the lives of other people. So that's- it's so important to have that, right? Especially it all starts in the mental game. Mm-hmm. I mean, 90% of your business is the mental game. Totally. It's, it's especially as an entrepreneur, because it is a, there is a roller coaster happening and you've always got to be thinking about how you can reinvent the real will, if you will. So we let's talk. Call. Let me share. We were on a call about this. So we had all yeah. the doctors on a call and there's about 120 of us. And, and that's, that was really the message was exactly that. It's like, mm. now is the time when we're being bombarded with fear, with fear 
from left and right, statistics here, statistics there to, to make us scared, to, to have a second guess, and, and just to have us just live smaller and smaller and, and just fearful. Now is the time, especially as, as orthodontists leading a team, as, as parents leading a family, that we need to step up and lead. Yep. And, and we need to show people the way of how we can be. Yes, we need to be careful. We need to take precautions, just, just like, we, like, like we're being instructed, follow the guidance, follow the laws. But the way that we can connect with people, we can still connect with people. Well, before we were able to do a lot of high fives and hugs, we're going to have to change that. We're still going to have to connect with them, whether that's through video or whether that's just gestures, virtual hugs, whatever we have to do with them so that they have a connection. You got it. Exactly that. Yeah, and we meet them where they are at. And so if it's, if it's people and back to kind of the paternalistic way of thinking, oh man, right when this happened, just like you, we were, I think we were hopeful this would take like two weeks, right? And everybody would be back. And if, if few of us thought this is going to be two weeks, because looking at China and looking at Europe of what they were doing, we immediately pivoted and got, got our 125,000 active patients all so we're able to be treated virtually with dental monitoring. And then we rolled out immediately a home impression kit so that we could get started with home impressions. Nice. So it, it, was, it was an immediate reinvention, and that's kind of how we feel about this. This was yep. the time to seize, to go through and establish step by step by step detailed treatment plans with next visit scheduled of where we were going so we could forecast what we needed for our schedules so we could make the lives of our patients and our teams and our doctors easier and so it's just it it is a it, this was a blessing in many ways yeah it absolutely but, was yeah so well and here's the thing what's cool about it is once you wake people up to it and i'm sure you have this on your call to finish the story of me talking to the doctor about you know uh, 25 to 50% down and that's not who you were before average. Yeah. The moment I said that, there was no, like it awoke in his brain and he went, you know what? You're right. Thank you for saying that. I think sometimes we need people to just say what we already know to us. And on that call with you with the 120 some dollar doctors, I'm sure there are people on there who were thinking that before, but then went, oh yeah, you know what? That I'm, I wasn't average before. Why would I even do that? Thank you for that because it sets the pace. We're so encapsulated in a world of negativity with the news, with what's on Facebook of whose fault it is and who's to blame and stuff. Instead of going, huh, you know what? This isn't the reality. Matter of fact, they're brainwashing you into a false reality. So you have to be around people who are willing to pull you out of that brainwash and actually wash your brain of the crap that's on there of all the news and stuff to say, Oh, there can be a better reality. Just like whether it be, we have a reality of many doctors inside of our, our office, or if we're going to grow our business by uh, 25%, my challenge to all my doctors right now is what if, what if by December 31st, 2020, you were up, over last year, what would that be like? Because I want them to walk in there to lead their team. You know, a lot of doctors, whenever they first meet up with me, one of the challenges that they'll say is, ooh, I'm, I'm not really good with leadership. Leadership is my challenge. If there wasn't a better chance right now for you to step up as a leader, to say, you know what? We're gonna do things differently. We're gonna actually like beat the, all the statistics. We're gonna lead our team members, uh, lead our patients, which, is one of the things I think is really interesting that you sent out the kits to everybody and you told everybody, hey, this is what we're doing now. I'm assuming that when you sent them that information, you didn't say, hey, so would it be okay if we possibly maybe um, did this thing for you and, um, and thought about it? And if not, it's okay, it's fine. But that's something that we we're thinking about doing, which is the stance a lot of people are taking for virtual right now. I know, I know. It, no, it's, it's claim authority and it's, it's do it. Yeah. This I, is what we're doing. Yeah, this is it. Yeah. How we get paid is, I mean, I heard that, I heard Nick Bradfield pounded that in my head is, is you just, you don't give an option. You explain how you're going to do it. And the patients are looking for confidence. Your team members are looking for leadership to follow. Yep. And if you create leaders in them, then it just, 
exponentially grows. You talk about leadership. I took a phenomenal course from Werner Earhart and um, he talked, it was on leadership. It was a, it was a five day and it was 16 hours a day course. And it was fantastic. And it was on leadership. And the gist of the course, we were all kind of waiting, like well, he's going to come out, he's going to, you know, explain that a leader is patent or, or you know, George Patton. What's the magic cool. pill? He's going to give us the pill. And, it's, and what, what it, you, we came to realize through, over the, the, the whole course, the five days, was that leadership is who you are being your authentic self. Mm. And, and if, you can, if you can go in and you can show vulnerability and you can lead through fear, you know, of what's going on, your team will follow you. Cause they're there for a reason right now. And if, and if they don't want to follow you, then they're not the right team for you. It's not that you're wrong. It's that you, you need to surround yourself with people who believe like you believe and who are going to go that way. And that's, that's how you attract patients the same way. Yep. So it is, it, it's a culture. I remember, I remember you saying that, that very thing and you pointed that out. Well, patients aren't late at your office because it's not cool to be late. And I looked and I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Because they look forward to our appointments. They look forward to connection. They're, I mean, they, yeah, we have some, some who show up late because of traffic or whatever, but they want to be there as much as we want them to be there. It's, it's a totally different thing. Yeah, it totally is. It's, it's that leader. And you're also leading the, the, um, the patients right now. I think that our, I think society, I think uh, the normal average Joe, average Jane, they're looking for leadership mm -hmm. and they can find it in an orthodontic practice. They can find it in a chiropractic office. They can find it in the dental office. They can find it if they're looking for it. And if you're willing to say, let me lead you, yep. let me show you how I can make your life easier and smarter. Matter of fact, I was, so I was just on a call right before this, I, uh, I'm teaching a team in Hawaii on sales. And I was talking about how, you know, a lot of people ask for a script, like, how can I script that? Mm -hmm. I was like, you know, my life isn't scripted. My life is authentic to who I am. Mm -hmm. And your story is way more powerful than a script. There's no script that will ever trump your story. So tell your story about braces. Tell your story about why you do what you do. And then you'll connect with people in that way. That's leadership. Like you're saying that the authentic, uh, authentic way to lead is to be your authentic self. Mm -hmm. Tell people who you are and they'll either say, cool, I want to be a part of that or I don't want to. And both are perfectly fine answers, but we just got to give them the opportunity to do so. Right. Someone asked a question here for you about the impressions. How did the home impressions go? They went great. I mean, it's uh, doing home impressions. We have to follow state laws. And so we follow those strictly. So some are different based on the the state law that we that we go but we immediately shot a video um and and got those turned around and then and then had instructions and then we we're just troubleshooting the whole way but that's kind of our team's mentality is like here's our project how can we do this and that's the question then posed to the team and then the team's like okay let me see and then we put our brains together of what we can do to solve the problem and so somebody said i heard uh, well it was at that leadership um conference it's like you you meet a wall well guess what you take your hat and you throw it over the wall you're gonna figure out a way to get over that wall yep. and that's what we do and so it's like well let's let's figure out how are we gonna overcome this and we're going to overcome this I went to an event once where uh, the motto of the event was this whole like overcome your fears and your concerns or whatever and it was uh, over under around or through whatever it takes, we will do. Nice. Right? And it's that idea, right, of the hat. Okay, there's a wall, over, under, around, or through, whatever it takes, we will do. Mm -hmm. I smiled when you were saying that because uh, one of the things that I, I, the stories that I tell as well around you is uh, this idea of like, we're gonna figure it out even if we have to troubleshoot it all the way through, even if it's not perfect right yeah. away. Yes. Because you were trapped in the perfection cycle that many people are. Oh, damn. <laughs> Dina. I think, I think it, it, runs, it runs rampant among orthodontists. It is trained into us. And you were the very first. That little millimeter difference, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, but, it, but, but. You cannot grow a business in millimeters. 
And, and that's, that's the trouble. And Scotty Hudsmith always said that. And, and you cannot grow a, a business by millimeters. Yep. And we get so caught up in perfection that, that it, it, it paralyzes us. And then the hardest part, and you nailed it, and this is where you saved my marriage, is you nailed it because that nick, nit, picky, just looking and, and, and picking things apart, like we never looked to see what was right. It was always what's wrong with the case. What's wrong with it? Yep. And, and, uh, and that's what I did to my wife. That's what I did to myself mentally over and over and over and to the point where it was just miserable. And so all I did was just try to overachieve, overachieve. No amount of money was enough. And, and I remember being crippled by it. I was the, I was the poorest rich orthodontist in the world. Mm. Cause I could never enjoy a thing ever, ever. Wow. Ever. That's a real, people should have written that down. Yeah. But are you I the never, poor? Are you the poorest rich orthodontist in the world? Yeah, because I just couldn't enjoy a thing, nothing. And I remember you—you you did it virtually, but you—you you basically reached through, grabbed me by the the coattails, and just, or by the coat, and just said, "You are Scott Law. If this all burns down, you're going to do it again." Yep. And I, and I had I had to realize that, and it's almost like right now is a time with with propreneurs with with all of us out there where we need that shake to be like we will get through this just like we got here we will get through this yep it's taken a lot for me mentally to to change that to change all the crap i had in my head of, of just the negative self-talk just beating myself up over and over and over and nitpicking all that perfection and and uh perfectionism to look for that it's really like you always said like you coined we're not perfectionists. We're, we're imperfectionists. We're only looking for what's imperfect. So yep. true. And when we changed our mindset, it all, it all changed. And the difference for me is I think, I, I think I've worked harder. I've, I, I know I have since because my motivations are different. I want to grow now for other reasons, not to prove that I'm enough, not to prove that I'm adequate, you know, to, to, for this or that I deserve it or deserving but that what difference can I make in the lives yep. of people? And that's, that is a, a greater motivation that's kept me going. I, like you, I think these last six weeks, I've never worked harder in my life than these last six weeks. And I, let me know. ask you, Scott, let me ask you this though about that. Um, Cause I have people reaching out to me and they'll be like, Dina, I know how you're doing it. I know how you're doing it. I know what, I mean, you're always doing something you have. And honestly, I feel kind of bad because I'm like, I don't, I, I, I didn't know there's another option. Years ago, I, um, I put on an event for T. Harv Eker, the author of Secrets of the Millionaire Mind. Yes. And I was asked uh, to get uh, 500 people in a room. And when the trainer showed up, there was 500 people in the room. And it was like, we didn't expect you to get 500 people in the room. We'd say that, but nobody ever gets people in the room. And so then they're asking me, how did you do it? And my answer was, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to. Like you told me that I was supposed to get 500 people in the room. So I worked my butt off to get 500 people in the room. Right now I feel that way too. It's like, I didn't know there's another way. I mean, I hear of course people like on binge watching shows on Netflix and eat, gaining weight and stuff. And maybe I'm gaining weight because I'm at my desk all day long for the last four weeks, five weeks. But COVID-19. COVID-19. <laughs> uh, but I didn't know, like, I don't know another way. So it's not like, I'm, I'm not going like, ooh, good for me. I'm saying like, when you turn it on as an entrepreneur, as a propreneur, you're a professional entrepreneur, be a professional. Yes. Um, the perfectionist thing that is very fascinating to me is the idea that we wear this as a badge of honor. Like, yeah, I'm a perfectionist mm -hmm. and it's poison. Mm -hmm. It poisons everything around you until you realize there's beauty in the imperfection. Like you said, there's ability to go, oh, I can fail and I'll survive. I can have that not millimeter and move on. Yep. And you're right. It is hard for a lot of people. I, orthodontists, obviously you do deal with millimeters. Let me do this. I want to kind of move the conversation over and thank you everybody for making comments. I appreciate Eddie and Ty and Stuart. And let's see, I want to make sure I acknowledge people for making comments because we want you to make comments in the comment box here. Nicole, Renata, really appreciate it. Um, if you have questions too, make sure you put them in the uh, Stuart. If, uh, oh, Stuart. Hey, Stuart. So I was going to mention earlier, uh, I got to have a good conversation with Stuart about him coming to your office too and having the aha of like, oh, it can be different, right? And 
Is that we talked a lot about that. Stuart Frost, yeah. Oh, heck yeah. Yeah, he's a, he's a rock star like that dude. He's he's yeah, and he's done that for for thousands of orthodontists that know this this way of treating can be achieved. Yeah, just it, it's it's what it yeah, is. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, okay, I want to pivot the conversation a little bit because you when we were uh, first connected, you had the office in Colleen, Texas, and you were just opening up another one in uh, down in Austin area, right? Right. Mm -hmm. The satellite office. Yep. That was. 2012 here we are eight years later yep. and you have expanded your reach your mindset your belief system mm -hmm. to over 200 offices across the country yep yeah that's right tell us about that evolution and uh i want to preface this with look i know there are people out there who are um, have thoughts or opinions around DSOs or around uh, corporations, stuff like that. The point for me that is so powerful in what you do, and I talk about this a lot from the stage, is I think there was something in you from our conversations that you knew you couldn't have the impact on the world the way that you wanted to, that you innately wanted to inside your heart until you had this straightened out and you were already doing great stuff in your office right you were doing really cool entrepreneurial things you had a great leadership but until you had number one your personal relationship figured out and connected yep. and then number two this the per the the personal relationship with yourself mm -hmm. you couldn't expand but once you did the fire that was underneath you and the expansion that happened in eight years is insane so tell us how that evolved and how that came to be so exactly like you said, I think, I think centering the relationship with myself and my own being able to actually love who I am and not nitpick me myself just, just to, to death allowed me to really see the, the humanity in other people. And, and to forgive myself for my imperfections allowed me to then see the pain and suffering other people feel. And so it just really opened me up to, to, empathy towards others and, and wanting to, wanting to serve. So with that, that I, I stopped telling myself stories of who my wife was, that she was, you know, whether it was, she's just always spending money and, and I, I don't want to go into huge detail. She's not here. It's not fair, but, but to go into what, things where she's last minute or sporadic or all these things, I only saw these as negatives and I saw everything she did as a negative instead of seeing, seeing the beauty of, of how she can at the drop of a hat go and help someone or that she's always thinking of something fun to be able to do with other people and how she is truly thinking ahead. I just didn't give her credit for any of that. And the same way goes for, for all these other, all these other things translated into business with, with seeing other people, the good in them and, and then magnifying them, not getting jealous for things that they might do, celebrating success of others, and, and just watching, watching more beget more and more. And then, and then seeing the change in myself, that became my, that was where I needed to go to find my gift was, is next to my pain. And, and so when I can go and find that wow. and help other people. And so it's, uh, and, that's and deep them the way mm -hmm. it, that's yeah. deep. I want people to hear that your gift is next to your pain. Yeah. That's great. And so, so when I was able to see who I can be for others and help them to, to get through what, whatever it is, however much they want to open up and change or, or they don't, I, I can, I can be a service to them. And so whether that's professionally or whether that's friends that we have and, and in just different ways where I can connect or, or even with my kids just to see what that is and help them in their journey and not judge them ever, ever. And that's, that's the biggest. I found that forgiveness and love are almost the same thing. And, and judgment is about, is the opposite of that. Mm. And, and so the, when, when we can do that, see people grow, see these offices that want to come on board, that want something different. They want a partner. We are very different. We're a DSO, but and excuse me, I know that they have a negative connotation for many, but we're pure play ortho. So we're very different. We don't have a captive patient base. So it's very much where 
we have to win people based on experience of, of that they have an awesome experience, that outcome wow. is great, and that they have great customer service. So we're very much like a like a like an independent practice that way. So we don't have that's awesome insurance. You know, we will not have our own people just cycling through, and so we have to have that. And in doing so, we have to. Our doctors want to join. They want to be a part of this culture. They want to see how can how can they affect people's lives at a different level. They may not be able to articulate that at the beginning, but they know these are awesome people. And uh, some of our all doctor meetings, when we were able to meet in person, um, the last the last time, they're just they're very emotional. People are able to stand up and go, "This is this has been the greatest." three, four, five years of practice of my life, of how I am able to connect with the team, connect with patients, not have to deal with this on, on the administrative side, but really just do the ortho and watch the, the, the gifts that I have to help other people. So it's kind of cool. What a, what a interesting relief. Uh, we talked about earlier about the entrepreneurial side of things. And we all know that, you know, you're not taught this in school and they don't give you a course on how to, you know, deal with people or, you know, how to, how to um, be an entrepreneur in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I can imagine that there's a lot of people that you're dealing with that are uh, looking into or actually join into being a part of Smile Doctors that have such an amazing sense of relief of, uh, I can just be really awesome at what I do and not have to worry so much about the business side of stuff because those systems are put into place and we have those. I can see what a huge benefit that would be. If, well, let me talk about a couple of things. First of all, I have noticed that the reason why, so I focus on the doctor down, top down situation, right? And when I go to my doctors, I say, look, I know we can talk about leader or or, uh, your team and how to strengthen that. That's cool. Or how to get more patients coming in. That's cool. But how are you? Like, because without that being there first, you can't give from an empty cup. So focus on that. And that, uh, listen, this is, I make no off of this, guys. I'm just saying this from what my observation is. And that's what I feel like my position is as a mentor is to seeing from outside the jar of what's going on. When I talk to Smile Doctor doctors, when I talk to even your other team members within the Smile Doctor organization, not the doctors, the people in the organization like Scotty and things like that, there's very much a doctor down, like top down, tip of the spear mentality of are we taking care of the doctors and you had a conversation with me once a while ago where you said part of your job that you've kind of evolved into and your role is when doctors do end up joining smile doctors about six months in you get some doctors who are talking to you a little freaking out going like oh my gosh what did i do should and like that make the right decision and your job has been to coach and mentor them through that conversation boy, I wish so many more people had that in general, right? To be able to just doctors on their own, let alone as part of this. How has that really affected you guys as a company, especially during right now, knowing that them knowing that they have people who have their back, thinking of them first as a human being, not the asset of the, of the business. Oh, totally. We, we are a, we are a family first organization. And when we say that we're, we treat each other as family, I know it's super cliche, but I've never known a different way to do it. Mm-hmm. So when, when people join us from outside and so some of our, some of our support team, so they've worked in other, in other industries or whatever, they come here and they're like, I got to tell you, Scott, I, I was waiting for the first three months for the other shoe to drop. Like what, what's going on? For the reveal the, behind the curtain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, like where, there, where's the fake? Like, really, yeah, you can only keep this up for so long. Right. And, and when, when they begin to see, like, this is special, this is different, and this is, this is incredible on how we get to work with each other, it is special. And that's the culture that, that you protect, protect fiercely. And, and what's cool is these doctors do join. Yes, there, there is. The change cycle is real. You know, you, there's, there's shock, there's fear, there's this, you just kind of go through it and then you come out the other side and, and we're all here to help one another because we've all experienced it many, many times with anything. Mm-hmm. Anything happened with, with this whole COVID thing. We all felt shock, fear, negotiating, like, how's this going to work? And then, we all went through you know, the stage of grief, right? <laughs> yes, yes, it is. And then, and then it's acceptance and it's growth through it, you know, on the yep. other side. But, but getting together as doctors, it's kind of cool because 
we're able to then magnify each other's strengths. So mm -hmm. if somebody has, if somebody wants to be a part of like this whole digital side, it's cool to see people who've come out of the woodwork who have a passion for that. And we're able to then go, okay, great. We need you because you think like this. Oh, how can, smart. How can you help this whole organization. So get in committees, get with that. Some people love plastics and, and treatment that way. Others want to want to get in how and hyper efficiency on treatment. What can we do uh, for for that bracket placement or or maximizing our visits? Others want to go through the whole patient experience. How can we how can we make this journey better or software integrations? Like there's just so many avenues. And when you have people whose focus is that every day pushing it forward, it is incredible to be a part of. And that's and, human resources. Yeah. As, as yes, I, my phone, I, I've said this before. So Siri, when I, when I sometimes, or whatever, autocorrect, when I put an assistant, A-S-S-T, like it'll autocorrect to asset. Ah, oh, nice. That, that's who our people are. Like our people are our biggest asset. When someone says, what's your special sauce? Like your secret sauce and small bars. It is our people. Mm. And it is who, who we have attracted. And we just attract more and more people like that. And as much as we've grown, we've said, we've said no to way more orthodontists than we've said yes to. Interesting. We just, we just won't. We, we won't do it. There, there's, it's how do they treat their team? How, what are some of the questions they ask us about who we are? Tells, them a tr tells us a tremendous amount about them. And, and we just don't want, we don't want that kind of negativity in our culture. It's not, it's not worth it. It won't work. They will be miserable and we will be miserable. And so we just, we want to avoid that situation. Wow. That's so powerful. Um, the human resource aspect, I think we've really kind of messed up the word human resource in business. Cause we think about hiring and firing. We think about, uh, there's a complaint department, right? But really, if we're thinking about it that way, we're thinking about human resources as what are the resources that we can tap into with the humans we're dealing with to improve ourselves. And right now, when we talk about growing after disaster, right, if you are not leaning and, and really like burring in to the human resources inside of your office, first of all, you're going to find out who you want to still have in that office. There are people that are watching this that I know that have team members that are like, man, I hope they don't want to come back from furrow, right? <laughs> I don't want them back. And, and understandably, but that's not their fault, by the way. As a leader, that's your fault. Sure. That's your fault for not being in integrity and loving that person enough to say, this is not a right fit for you, right? Or sorry, we are not a right fit for you. Right. Um, but being able to, uh, Tracy says that, uh, Tracy Martin said that you make her want to send you her resume. So that's a really good compliment right there. That's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. And uh, thank you, Todd. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it is refreshing to hear. And that's what we wanted to talk about. We want to talk about, have different conversations than what's going on out there. Somebody, uh, Renata, all the way from Australia, I believe, she asked, how do you find team members who have and share uh, your vision and are enthusiastic. How are you guys? Because your recruiting process, your uh, your onboarding process has got to be pretty thorough. Like you just said, we don't want anybody to be miserable, us including them. So how do you recruit those people? Yeah, you you touched on HR, right? Mm -hmm. So HR, we see it, and and our CEO uh, Jay Hedrick sees HR as an offensive position, and so we just got a, a chief HR officer. Her name is Lynn Corville. And she's, she actually came on two days before, before this. Wow. <laughs> Baptism for fire. Welcome. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> a rock star. Just amazing. But yes, we see it as very much. How can we offensively move this instead of defensively? What do we need to do? Liability and, 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 you know, this is going to cost me this much and this and that. It, and we see it as a, a different way. But to, to answer the question about recruiting. So if, if for team members, I'll answer it at the, at the local level. So okay. for, for team members, what we do, and this is kind of our secret. So we will hold a group interview time. And we'll go through and we'll screen, screen resumes and, and whatever. But and then we'll invite just a ton to come in. So if we have one or two assistance that positions open so clinical assistance there then we'll have them come in 
And our team is a, is a huge part of it. Because if you have an awesome culture, then you want them to be the ones to pick it. You want them to, to say, yeah, we want, we want people like us to not screw this up. Right. So we wanted, we're going to huddle and defend our ball. You got it. Yep. You got it. And so this is how we've always done it. We, we'd always done it like this. And so um, we play goofy games because that was us. So we had a beach ball. It had questions on it and whatever. Nice. So Love it. Throwing it around because everyone was waiting in the reception room. And it was funny because many of them, all, they would just mean mug all the, other, all the other people in the room and especially the other candidates and waiting to talk to the doctor. Right. And so they didn't know that that was the interview. The interview was the team. And so, you know, whatever question landed on your right thumb, you had to answer your favorite dog or whatever. Right. So you just go through it. And uh, so we do that. And then we would speed date. So we'd pick three or four people in the back. Somebody would run the timer and you got two minutes. And for consistency on HR, we'd ask the same questions in each chair. And so like, who's your favorite superhero and why? Um, you know, what's the, what's the most Mr. Incredible. Go ahead. Got it. Okay. Why? No. And then because he's so much like me, he was fat and he could get better. And I, yeah, I love it. So, so you'd want to see, and you could relate with somebody like that instead of so much about, you know, some, some question about their job history. Well, that's, that's all on the, that's all. Right. Yeah. Why ask, why, why are you repeating a question they've already answered? Yeah. Yeah. So we would just go through that and get to know them. Some of them hated it. And they're like, this is weird, you know, great. Okay, you're not a fit. I'm That's so glad right. you found out right now. Yes. And others would go, this is the coolest thing I've ever been a part of. And we could see it. And then there was some manual dexterity stuff that we would, we would try, you know, just whatever, bend a paperclip and do stuff like that. But at the end, our team would then go, hey, this is one that we want to have come in so we can see in a working environment. And, and just see how do they, how do they, how do they work? And depending again on your HR laws, you can, you can do this, but if you can get them in and you can have them work for eight hours, it's really hard to fake it for eight hours. Somebody can fake it through about a two hour interview. And and Scotty Hudsmith would always say, is this the kind of person that you can take an eight hour car ride with? Yes. Right. And you're going to have different types of people. Your, your front desk party is going to be different than your finance person. Yep. You need those different personalities and strengths, but can you still ride in a car with them for eight hours? And that was, that was always our thing. So that's just how. Tony, Tony Shea from Zappo said that uh, their, their criteria was that after eight hours, do you want to go have a beer with them? That's what his thing was. Like well, after eight hours working with them, do I want to have a beer with them still? And well, if not, it doesn't work. And it's true, right? You want to see people in different uh, dynamics. Uh, Dave Ramsey, I, I quote this. I remember two years ago, I was listening to him on the radio, and he was talking about they had just gone out and done their uh, holiday thing. And I know a lot of offices here will go take their teams out to the mall and give them $100, you know, and go spend it or $200, whatever. And he was taking all 200 of his employees out, gave them all $1,000 to go and spend it however they wanted. But he said, listen, working for our company, you have to go through 10 different interviews before you are hired. People ask him all the time, why 10? He said, because if you let people talk, they will tell you who they are. And in a basic little interview like that, they don't let you know. And like you said, playing a game, people tell you who they are. Having to do things that are a little silly and different. It's like, man, I thought I was here for a dentist interview, an orthodontic interview. It's like, "Uh uh-huh. Nope. You're here to be part of the culture. That's yeah. secondary. Like you said, people are the resource. And yeah. so it's so powerful. We can, um, train, we can train um, people. We yes. We can train them skill, we, but we can't. Changing attitude and taking them from the mindset, that, that can change slightly over time. But man, where do you want to begin? You probably don't want to begin way back here and drag them through and risk your culture. So you want to find people like you and then everybody get better together. I would take enthusiasm over skill any day because you can always train skill. Yep. Fit. You can always train talent and in that order. What'd you say? Sorry. Say that again. Hire for fit first, skill second, talent third. So love it. Love it. So true. Okay. So Scott, I, um, we need to obviously start wrapping up a little bit here, but um, one of the things I really want to focus on, obviously, and I hope people are getting this, uh, in, first of all, inspired through what can happen growing after disaster, right? What, what are we going to get to next? 
I hope people are taking away from them that the team is going to be the way that you're going to get through this. The team and your leadership, your mindset, making sure that you believe that you are the best in the world at what you do, which is where my next topic is. So I get out on stage and I often will start off my conversation with, hello, my name is Dino Watt and I'm the best in the world at what I do. And I'm standing in front of a group of people that I believe are the best in the world at what they do, or at least I hope they believe so. You've had kind of that mindset for a while, not in that braggadocious way, not in that non-humble way, but man, if we're going to do this, then forget the rules that are there. Like, of course, the legal rules, yes, but the made up rules that we have as an industry, no. So that to me has told me that you put yourself in that position of we're the best in the world. When a mom walks in this office, she has the right to believe that she, that, that, that we believe that we're the best in the world at what we do. I never want to take my kid who has a heart disease to go to the second best heart surgeon, right? Or the guy who just passed or will to give it his best shot, right? I want to do it, take him to the person who knows they're a killer. How do you implement that mindset into your organization and especially your members when there is such a, a, a negativity going on in the world right now? How do you implement to them and, and kind of drill into them? They're the best in the world what they do individually and they bring that into the office. Totally. Um, one of our one of our big things that we say is is awesomeness. That we we talk about awesomeness all the time. And and I think if you don't have the mindset that that this patient needs to come to you, that they should be coming to you, and you have a duty to let them know the services you can provide to to change their life, change their smile forever. Then, then you need to really rethink why are you doing what you're doing. But as far as mm. office goes, one of the, one of the things that, that we always point out with our team is look for the good and reinforce that over and over. Similar mm. to, to mindset that I had with my wife, like look for the awesome in her all the time. And as I've done that, I just see I married the most incredible person in the world. And, and I get to create more of that. And my relationship with her changes to be more and more and more of what I want. And the same thing happens with our team. So when you can look and you can see that they are doing great things and they do something really great, point that out. And there will be a hunger there and an opportunity for us to go, this was great, excellent performance on this. I appreciate who you are as a person, you know, separately. That, that value of a person, performance is separate. And when you have that and you appreciate them and you love them, care for them and want to see them succeed, then, then it's really easy to talk about performance that they had a great, they did a really great thing. They did this really well. And this one, and then they can easily, we can talk about what didn't go so well on performance, right. but it doesn't change their value or their worth. And, and then they're, everyone is hungry then to improve. And so it's like, great, how can I be better for you and you for me and us for the patients? And, and it's that type of mentality. And that's the momentum that we get where we get to see offices just do, just do incredible numbers. And, and, and we count them, we count them changing lives is what we call it. So how many lives did we change today? Yes. By getting started with treatment. And, be, and we believe it. It's not the braces. It's not the aligners on their teeth that are going to change. Right. It is their mindset of themselves. All of a sudden, little Jimmy or, or Margaret, you know, she gets to change her teeth. Well, guess what? Her mentality about herself or, or Jimmy about himself will change. And all along the way, our job is going to be to reinforce that, to be how much we appreciate them, notice this about them, and, and it opens them up to all possibility in their life. That's what we do. Luckily. It's so true. And I, 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 if more people took that mentality, first of all, uh, I, it just, when you said that about looking for the good and focusing on that, it just made me think of that, like seek and ye shall find, right? One way or the other, yeah. seek and ye shall find. <laughs> you want to seek out the bad and you're going to find it. Seek out the good, you're going to find it. Um, I, that, that connected with me a lot with what you just said about it's not the brace, it's not the thing. So I tell my story of my supernumerary, since you mentioned that earlier, you know, and jacking up my teeth. Um, I often talk about, you know, I, I had a name like Dino in the 70s. I had a speech impediment, I had jacked up teeth, I had divorced parents, there weren't, wasn't a lot going on for Dino at the time. And I got my braces on and 
I don't, I mean, I, I loved my braces because it gave me attention. And back then, not a lot of kids had braces like they do now, like every other kid has braces. So it gave me attention and I love that. But I didn't recognize how much the braces uh, changed me until I got into this world more with the orthodontist because of that mentality of realizing, you know what? I'm so grateful for Dr. Frosch who did my braces because maybe he wasn't the most, uh, the, the greatest bedside manner, right? Maybe there was the door that I had to go through, right? The, I called it the, the dungeon door, right? The you rang, you know, door that I went through. And I still remember that to this day, walking through that door every single time I went in. But the aftermath of getting braces and getting that treatment completely transitioned my life to where it gave me the opportunity to smile with my showing my teeth. You know, it, it made me feel like I, I wasn't embarrassed about certain things, but it was the mental shift that was so important to me. I want to ask you real quick before we wrap up is sometimes your awesomeness too much for team members. Are there team members who can't handle being around that awesomeness. And it's funny because when we first got on the call before we got on, I asked you how you're doing and no one ever says what I say, which is I'm awesome. And you said it and you kind of took away. I'm like, okay, well, I'm not going to say that now, Uh, but, uh, but I love that. Right. Because it's the awesomeness. But the fact of the matter is there are people who can't handle and not in a bad way. I'm not judging anybody. I'm just saying that there are times where that awesomeness almost feels overwhelming. And so, it's they 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 can't be around it and they push. Have you had that experience where people are like, you know what, I can't be here anymore because the awesomeness is too much. I think initially it's shocking. So it is ah. that people are like, what is this? And they put up a guard that they're afraid to get hurt. I think that everybody wants it. You know, mm-hmm. everybody wants that, but some people do have a lot of pain around it and and they they're afraid to be authentic themselves and so they think ah you're not really being sincere and if i and if i show that i appreciate it then then it can hurt me and and i think the the most important thing is when we do come and we is anything that we say is an integrity like you said is is real is authentic it's not manipulative it's not something where we're trying to get a result from them but really we're wanting them to progress. Join us. And exactly, exactly. Mm. And just like when you're up there and you're, you're lecturing to a, a group of us and you're seeing, you're, you have the confidence and, and show, I'm the best at what I do. And, and you are too, and I'm here to help you be that if you don't all the way fully believe. We are the same way with our patients where it's not, I am the best at what I do and yeah, you're going to work around me and you're, and you're so lucky to be around me. Right no. yeah, it's, it's, and I am here to serve you and make you the best you can be, whether that's with, with a beautiful smile, whether that's with changing your outlook, whether that's whatever they want to be. And, and as we do it, they grow through it. They become the most incredible people, whether that's within the organization or they outgrow the organization, they go do something else with their life. Yeah. Uh, awesome they get to that's go- why i love the story of ruby definitely because that's a great uh, for people who don't know ruby was the tc office manager and she wanted to be a southwest airline uh not stewardess what do you call them that is flight attendant yes and and when she got that call you the way you guys reacted of oh man we're gonna miss ruby but we're so excited for her we want to see her grow It's one of the questions when I go out to an office before I do, I send out a survey to all the team members and I ask, do you feel that your bosses or your, your doctor support you so much in your growth that they would support you even if it meant you ultimately weren't going to stay here? Because that's important. It's important for people to know, no, they want me to grow beyond where I am. Even if it, I mean, if I stay here for the next 30 years, great. But if not, and they want me to hit those dreams. And that's a Ruby moment to me. And that was very, very powerful for me to hear you talk about that. Yeah. Um, I had a mentor once say to me, the key or the, the true definition of humility is knowing that you are a genius at something that every single person that you stand in front of is not, and that they are a genius at something that you are not. 
Mm. And when you can stand there in front of people and know that and be like, yeah, we're the best in the world at what we do. And I know you're the best in the world at what you do. That's, that's something that I'm not. That's key, right? That's cool. um, we could talk about stuff for hours, man. Seriously. We oh, have. I love it. Yes. <laughs> we have before. I hope everybody watching this, you know, if you have some questions before we sign off, we're going to sign off in about three minutes here, folks, uh, three to four minutes, depending on your questions, ask a question, please. If not, just give us a big shout out of uh, you learned something, you, you had a good time, you had a laugh, you had an aha. But I hope that everybody watching this saw that the goal and are actually the best way to grow from this disaster that we're in, from this downtime. And, you know, I say disaster, and I don't want to frame it as it's a bad thing. Uh, Shannon posted when this first started a thing about crisis, and that in the Chinese uh, vocabulary, crisis has two meanings. It means, you know, sad and depressing and frustration, or it means opportunity. Mm. And I, I hope that you see through this that the best way to come out of this, in my opinion, is to aim higher than you were higher than you were before that you actually see more possibilities in front of you than what you saw before matter of fact hopefully you got clear hopefully your your mindset was like oh my gosh look at this time i have I had to sit down and i said at the very beginning this is our someday right all those things that you said oh, i'll get to that someday i'll get to that someday and it never came this is your someday we had somebody saying here, we had Nicole say, no, don't go. I could listen to you guys all evening. Thanks, Nicole. That's nice. Uh, so great. Thanks, guys. Hey, Nicole. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Scott. Thank you, guys, for being here. I really appreciate that. Any, any last uh, words of advice as people are coming out of this, as we do see more offices that are going to get back into play, what would be uh, any words of advice you'd want to give to everybody as they're getting ready to get back in the world? You know what I would do? This, this is what we talked with our doctors about is it's really, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. We've all heard this, Simon Sinek, right? Yeah. And get with your team and get together and hit it head on, be authentic and transparent, straight up, about fears that people might have of what's going on and what the future likes and is like and, and how you are going to create your own future and how you're there, you got their back 100%. And that how you're going to come together as a team. Use this really as an opportunity to grow and, and get in front of it. And, and then stuff's going to change. This is going to be fluid. Who knows what's going to happen? And, and all we can do is just, just take it bit by bit, trust one another, and, and it'll be incredible what you and your team form and, and how you grow through it. A ton of practices I know grew through huge tragedy. Um, Katrina, so, so Deborah and Wynn, they're part of Smile Doctors. They have been a huge help for us, learning how they got punched in the nose through Katrina, and wow. they worked hard through it, and so, so much of what they, they experienced, they were able to share with us, and we are able to go forward as, a, as an organization, but it's this time to get together and then create your own destiny, what you want, and, and form your mindset and get your team united, and your momentum will just grow. It's awesome. Isn't that interesting that um, you bring up a really interesting point I was thinking of just the other day is this is the first time where a majority of us aren't watching the tragedy from uh, not being in that, in, in that position. Meaning we had tra uh, Katrina, you guys recently in Houston had the floods. Uh, was it la last year, year before last? Yeah. Harvey, was that it? Is that what you're Harvey. About? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You had that. Um, there's, you know, disasters and every, every state, every city can talk about, oh yeah, when this thing happened, whether it be an earthquake or a disaster. And many of us watching this right now, many of us weren't involved in that. So we're, we're empathetic. We're sympathetic. We're like, oh, that's sad, but it's not happening to us. This is the first time where literally as a country, we all can empathize with one another, where we all can be like, yeah, there will be a conversation about pre-COVID and post-COVID. Mm -hmm. Where were you? How did you come out of it? And in my personal opinion, and I know this might be hard for some people, but man, if you're coming back the same way that you got into this, you missed an opportunity. And I, I don't have a lot of respect for that. I don't. Yep. If you're going to go, because somebody was saying this uh, a moment ago in one of my, oh yeah, I have a, so I have a, a mastermind that I went to and they said, People keep talking about getting back. There is no back. You can't get back. 
It's like with couples when I would, when they'd say, oh, I want to get back to where we were when we first were married. No, you don't. You, you wouldn't want to marry that joker. Like, no, you want to get, you want to move forward. Yes. You want to get to something. I want to get to that. I want to move towards that, not get back. That's no right. one wants to get back. That's it. Lead so it. this is, this is a opportunity of a lifetime. Lead through it right now. Huge, huge. We're going to be telling stories of this. They're going to be people, they're going to be a blockbusters. I, I, I posted this today. Uh, Michelle Shimon runs the ortho masterminds group. And somebody was asking, maybe it was yesterday. Somebody asked about, um, are you going to, are you doing virtual uh, consultants, uh, consultations, and are you planning on doing it in the future? And my comment was not doing virtual moving forward is a blockbuster and a taxi mentality versus a Netflix and an Uber mentality. And that's going to make the difference. Now you can do that. And that's fine. That's, I don't think you can be successful with it, but anyways, we could go on forever. Everyone's saying hello, saying thank you. Oh, thank you everybody. Really appreciate that. Love this. Oh, Oh, sorry. That's a private conversation between John and uh, Nicole. Uh, <laughs> but uh, if you, uh, Diana, if you hadn't caught it from the beginning, that's okay. The replay will happen on my page uh, throughout the rest of the time. Okay. So thank you so much, Scott, for your time. I mean, this has been amazing. I really appreciate it. Yep. Love you, brother. I love you too. And it's, this is so fun to see you guys grow and what you're doing and the good that you're putting out there in the world. Everybody who's watching, I'm going to, again, you see it on the ticker this whole time, go just like smile doctors, see the culture that they're doing there. Um, look, I think that there are things if I'm not, I'm not saying you uh, need to join a DSO or join smile doctors, but gosh, I learned from Nordstrom's. I learned from Disneyland. I learned from, Learn from companies that are having these great successes and imp implement those into your practice. Absolutely. There's, there's a good friend of mine uh, who says that uh, w when it comes to marketing, marketing should really, it's not, uh, it's not R and R it's uh, in the sense of research and R R D and R and D it's not research and development. It's uh, it's rip off and disseminate. I mean, you go and find companies that are doing great stuff, whatever the company is, rip that stuff off and disseminate it down to your company and make sure that you're able to do it. Same thing. Do this with Smile Doctors. Do this with Disney. Do this with all these other companies that you can say, oh, how can I do that? How can I grow like that? Um, John says that uh, Dino and Scott, you guys are amazing. Thank you. Uh, thank you for giving so much of yourself and your time, your friends. Absolutely, you guys. This is what it's all about, helping you guys grow and be amazing. Uh, I'm going to tell everybody right now, again, go to dinawatt.com, sign up for my newsletter because tomorrow we're uh, opening up enrollment for the Selling Through the Screen uh, Challenge. It's a challenge. You can be a part of the challenge. We're going to give away some cool stuff, some cool prizes that you want to be a part of and to prepare you for Selling Through the Screen. It's going to be something that we're going to do to big uh, outside of the ortho industry later on, but right now we're just keeping it exclusive to the ortho industry. Thank you, Scott, again, for being here. Thank you, everybody, for showing up. I really appreciate it. Any last words? No, lead through it. This is an opportunity to do it. Reinvent yourself right now. So excited. Oh, somebody sent a quote. I'm going to lead with the. I'm going to leave with this. Ron, uh, somebody said Ron Roth, who's an orthodontist who passed away years back, said, if there's an orthodontist in your area who is better than you, it is your moral obligation to refer your patients to them. Oh, that's really good. That's really, that's really good. You better get better. <laughs> you better get better. Yeah, that's that's huge. All right, everybody. Thank you, Marcy. Thank you, Eddie, for being here. Thank you, everybody, for showing up. Really appreciate it. Everybody, have a great night, and we'll see you on the next live that we do. Thanks, Scott. Thanks. All right. Bye, Dino. Bye-bye. Thanks so much again for listening to the Propreneur Podcast. We really appreciate your support. If you haven't subscribed already, please make sure you do so. Also, if you feel like you might be a good fit for our podcast as a guest or know somebody who you think would be, go ahead and email us at dino at dinowatt.com. Again, thanks for support. We'll see you on the next episode.